The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. She was elected leader of the Green Party of Canada amid the pandemic, and her time at the helm has been anything but smooth. Tonight, fresh from last night's English leaders' debate, Annemi Paul is here to talk about where her party has been and where she hopes to take it. Then, filmmaker Dia Khan sits down with Nam Kiwanuka to talk about her documentary, Muslim in America, which chronicles the increased hatred and intolerance faced by Muslim Americans during Donald Trump's presidency. And our Ontario hubs look at what's behind new calls for a standard definition of hate crimes and why that needs to be an official part of the criminal code. It's Friday, September 10th, and that's next on The Agenda. We've interviewed a lot of party leaders on this program over the years, but I'm not sure we've ever interviewed one the day after their first ever national election leaders debate. But we'll do that tonight with Annemie Paul, the leader of the Green Party of Canada, who's seeking personal election in Toronto Centre. And she joins us now from the national capital to talk about campaign 2021. Annemie Paul, it's good to have you back on TVO. How are you doing? Uh, great, and great to be back with you, Steve. You know, I always love your show. I appreciate hearing that. How did you like the experience of participating in the leaders' debate last night? I, it was it was wonderful. It was um, it was bittersweet because on the one hand, it was great to have the opportunity to introduce myself to the people of Canada uh, and to share our ideas for the future of the country. On the other hand, Steve, it was just I mean, it was too short. Uh, we should have more debates. Uh, we should really give people the opportunity to get to know us. I don't see how you can talk about uh, all of the issues that we did and do them any justice uh, in the amount of time that we had. Well, I don't say this because you are here, but I have really scoured a lot of the, the media accounts of last night. And I have to say, this one's typical. I'll read this from Robin Urbach, who tweeted out, it's too bad that the Greens spent the past few months punching themselves in the head because Annemi Paul is excellent in this debate and it's really too bad they've squandered her. I'm not even sure what the question is coming out of that other than a lot of people think you did very well last night. They also think you probably needed to hit it out of the park in order to overcome some of the stuff you've been dealing with. Do you think you did? Oh, now that's not for me to say. <laughs> I, I went up there hoping to represent, uh, well, there are a lot of things, you know, as you said, it's, it's, um, it was a first in, in many respects and, and uh, I wanted to uh, do honor and, uh, and represent well all of the people who were counting on me, uh, including our members. Uh, I wanted uh, to be able to uh, to know that at the end of it, I had uh, I had just done my best, and so I think that I did. I'm really grateful to uh, the very young team of people that uh, helped to prepare me, uh, but I'll leave it for the uh, the pundits and and uh, the public, I guess, to decide how well I did. There was I'll do one more on this, and then we'll talk about your platform. But there was there was a moment in the debate last night where you and the Bloc Québécois leader had quite a frosty exchange where he seemed to think that you were insulting him and you tried to assure him that you weren't, but rather you were trying to open a door to have him educate himself on some of the issues uh, that are of deep concern to you. Just, if you would, peel back the curtain a bit for us and tell us, did the two of you have a moment after the debate where you might have got together and kind of pursued that a bit? Well, unfortunately, because of COVID restrictions, we, we, uh, our, our arrivals and departures were staggered. And so there wasn't any opportunity like that. Uh, but certainly, you know, Steve, my approach has been for as long as I can remember, uh, given the identities that I have, to always extend a, a hand uh, in understanding. I don't assume ill will when I hear something uh, objectionable. Uh, I offer to educate. And in this case, I think that there needs to be some, some understanding about the experience uh, that those, uh, those people like myself have had, both in politics, but also um, in, in relation to systems that unfortunately throw up unnecessary barriers. So I had extended that invitation to uh, Mr. Blanchet on a number of occasions when these issues had come up, and it's an open invitation. And it really is extended uh, in a, a gesture of, of goodwill and, and seeking to find that common ground. Okay, moving on to talk about the platform. Uh, the Green Party doesn't have its name for nothing. Uh, obviously, climate change is the issue for you. 
And I wonder if we could just start with this neutral, open-ended question. Why do you think your platform is better than the other parties as it relates to tackling climate change? It's really in a class on its own. And, and I say that with a lot of, of, I guess, really a heavy-heartedness because it, uh, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, the science is really clear about what we need to do. You know, for me, when I became, you know, when my eyes were opened, and I think a lot of people in Canada, they can point to the day or the time that their eyes were opened about the climate uh, emergency. I went looking for a party that was offering the best policies on the climate. And for someone with my background, which is in policy analysis, it was really clear that it was the Greens, and, and it still is. Uh, we know for a fact, every party knows for a fact, that we cannot continue to bring online new uh, fossil fuel projects. We cannot continue to explore for oil and gas. Uh, we can't continue to subsidize fossil fuels and have any hope of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as we need to. And unfortunately, for the moment, the Green Party stands alone uh, in that understanding and in policies that reflect it. And I think that that's the main thing that people in Canada should take away. We just can't do one thing if we're hoping to do the other. I know you think you have an important story to tell, your, you and your party, as it relates to climate change. But I also hear other voices out there, for example, the Green Party leader, the former Green leader from British Columbia, as well as others, David Suzuki, for example, who believe the Liberals have a superior platform to you. Can you explain that? I, I wasn't aware that Mr. Suzuki uh, thought that. Uh, I know that he is supporting a variety of candidates from a variety of parties, including the Conservative Party. Uh, in the case of Mr. Weaver, uh, I, I just have to respectfully and, and sincerely respectfully disagree with him. Uh, our green uh, recovery, our green future uh, plank of our platform was put together by five climate scientists. Uh, we know all of them PhDs uh, and another one who has one on the way. Uh, and after extensive consultations with uh, climate and environmental groups in this country and internationally. And I think that it reflects best practices and the gold standard in terms of what we need to do. There was just a report, Steve, yesterday in Nature uh, that I saw in the BBC that said that this has got to be the peak decade for oil, that we need to keep at least 60% of the fossil fuels that are in the ground in the ground. And likely in regions like Canada, we need to stop extraction altogether if we're going to limit uh, um, increases in global average temperatures. You know, I'm going to fact check myself here. Uh, as I recall now, David Suzuki, I think, said the Liberal uh, climate change plan was better than a New Democrats as opposed to yours. So let me correct that for the record right now, although he's very bullish on the Liberal plan. Now, let me ask you about this global climate supercomputer that is a part of your platform. What's that about? This is why I love coming on your show, because we get to the policy, you know, and there is just no time last night to get to the to the exciting policy ideas. So what we what we have been told by by and when I say we, I mean the let's say the the political class by the science scientific class uh, is that they simply have uh, not been able to predict the kind of extreme weather and climate events that we have been seeing lately. Uh, and that was the case with the heat dome that settled over BC. Uh, it was the case with the uh, extreme flooding that happened in Europe. They have said that the reason that they missed these things and they weren't able to warn us about them was that they didn't have the computational capacity to do it. And so they have said that for less than a billion dollars, that they could develop a supercomputer to be used globally that would allow them to properly anticipate these events. And obviously, that is a fantastic investment. That is something that Canada could do, or at least lead. Uh, and that's where we should be looking uh, to show global leadership. I note that yours, I believe, is also the only platform that has, as one of its planks, a universal basic income. Why is that in there? Oh, to you know, and this is this is our way. I will acknowledge that the NDP, while it wasn't part of their 2019 platform, they also have a section. It's it's very brief, but they do have a section recognizing the need for a what we both call a guaranteed livable income, and so that's really exciting. And this is really what uh, what uh, the Green Party does best of all, which is introduce policy ideas uh, into the political discourse that eventually uh, we build a consensus around. Uh, a guaranteed livable income is the thing that we need to replace all of these emergency benefits uh, as they begin to wind down uh, in recognition of the fact that there were big gaps 
uh, which is why we needed these emergency benefits. It's the thing that allows us to make progress towards transitioning our economy without leaving anyone behind. The thing that allows us to recognize that the nature of work is changing uh, and that is going to also leave people behind. They need a strategy. And more than anything, it's a recognition that uh, we can afford to ensure that everyone in Canada can live in dignity regardless of their circumstances and that our patchwork system of programs simply hasn't achieved that. How much would it cost? How would you fund it? And there's more great news there. And again, loving the policy questions. <laughs> uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, budget officer uh, did a, uh, you know, he was asked to cost a guaranteed livable income, and he did it on the basis of the Ontario pilot program, which was unfortunately cancelled uh, by the uh, the current Conservative government. And what he found, Steve, was just good news, and it's the reason why there is this growing cross-party consensus around a guaranteed livable income. First, he found that uh, a guaranteed livable income would lift uh, about half of the people who are currently in poverty out of poverty. He also found that there was virtually no no uh, disincentive to work that would arise from a guaranteed livable income. And he also said that it was affordable, that I believe, oh, I, I'm so nervous about c quoting the exact amount. I want to say, I'm not going to quote it. Let's just say it's uh, it was an expensive program, but one that he said that we absolutely could afford uh, through um, uh, consolidations of, of existing programs through the cutting of administrative costs. And as you, we both know, much of the costs of our social programs is on the administrative side. So anything that we can do to simplify for people is going to save us a lot of money. So it's affordable, it's doable, it would lift a lot of people out of poverty, and it wouldn't create any issues for our labor market. All right. As I set up the next question, which uh, admittedly is going to be a bit of a long one, uh, let's watch you at work last night in the leaders' debate, shall we? A global issue. Uh, this is a national issue. This is a nonpartisan issue, and we have got to be able to come together across party lines. I wanted. I said that I was available for a debate just on the climate because it's that important. But we and we've invited many times all of the parties to join us in a joint cabinet, a cross-party cabinet, to deal with this the way that we dealt with the pandemic together. People were so inspired to see these leaders come together yeah. in the early days of the pandemic. We have got to bring that. That same approach here. We Let's do. come together Mr. because Singh. that's what's yeah. needed. Okay, I'm going to suggest, Annamie Paul, that last night at the leaders' debate was really for very, very, very many Canadians the first chance for them to actually see you in action. And I have been surprised by the number of people that I've spoken to during the course of this campaign who know nothing about you, even though you've been the leader for a good chunk of time. And, you know, you're on TV a lot, you're on the news a lot. Okay, why am I raising this? Because I think through the course of, of the campaign, we have been able to see those moments, and we saw some of them last night, where your party, the Liberal Party, the New Democratic Party, you know, if you put a Venn diagram up there, and maybe even the BQ on some things, there's some overlap. I mean, you progressives are all sort of swimming in the same lake trying to attract many of the same voters. So take this opportunity, if you would, and tell us what's the unique selling proposition of the Greens? Why would people want to vote for you as opposed to one of those other progressive parties? Uh, first, uh, that we are able to recognize and, and to, to celebrate the fact that we do have things in common. Uh, as you heard in that clip, there are many occasions when we have invited the other parties to participate in uh, a cross-party cabinet a focus on the climate emergency because we know that that is the way that we can get action the quickest uh, by putting aside partisan uh, concerns. And uh, we have had no response from any of the parties uh, for that. There are many times when on other uh, progressive social policies, we have asked for uh, unanimous consent or we've asked for support uh, for a particular declaration and recognizing that we all agree uh, and we still haven't received it because again, it would mean acknowledging that we had had a good idea. And so that is something that at least I can say I certainly bring and I think our, our MPs have demonstrated as well. Uh, we have got to be able to work together across party lines on the issues that matter the most. Every single Green MP that is elected is someone who is committed to that. And that in many ways, Steve, is the thing that is preventing uh, the kind of 
quantum leap forward on social issues and on the climate that we need. Uh, the willingness to give other people credit, to celebrate the accomplishments of other parties, to acknowledge that no party uh, has a, um, a monopoly on all of the good ideas and that we can work together and that we're stronger together. Okay, but if, if I'm sitting home watching this right now and I'm thinking to myself, I like what I'm hearing from the Greens, but I also see some stuff that the Liberals are doing that I'm okay with, and the NDP have got some good ideas as well. And who knows, maybe even Aaron O'Toole's got some things going on because he's running a more centrist campaign than previous Conservative leaders. And then I say to myself, yeah, but Annamie Paul's not going to be Prime Minister. So why should I vote for you when I know you're not going to be Prime Minister as opposed to one of the other parties? Because every Green MP uh, is an MP that is committed to representing their community. And that's important to say as well, because, you know, we've gotten very far away. We've strayed very far away from uh, the way our system was designed, which is you elect an MP for a certain riding. They're there to represent the people who elected them, and that should be um, their primary focus. Uh, people who elect Greens can know that, that they're going to have a champion within their uh, local community, and they can know that they have someone who's a champion of progressive values that is willing to work with others well in order to uh, expedite our progress. Um, Steve, you know, we have all of the policy solutions we need uh, in order to tackle poverty, in order to tackle uh, homelessness and affordable housing, in order to tackle the drug poisoning epidemic. And, you know, it was pointed out last night by the moderator that it seems like what is lacking is the political will to do so and the willingness to work with the other parties to get it done. So if we head back into a minority parliament in particular, uh, every Green MP that is elected is someone you can count on to bring that spirit of collaboration to Parliament. All right. Uh, once again, I'm going to ask our viewers uh, to and our listeners on podcast to imagine the debate stage last night. And you were the only woman up there, obviously, but you were also the only person up there who didn't have a seat. And that takes me to my next area of questioning. You are running for personal election in Toronto Centre. You don't have a seat. You've run there before, unsuccessfully, although, admittedly, you improved the Green Party showing uh, in the last by-election that was contested there quite significantly. You're also doing something, and here's the question. I, I don't think it's ever happened before where a National Party leader spent the vast majority of her time in one riding. That's what you're doing. How come? There, there are a couple of reasons. First, uh, you know, I am... In many ways, a first. Uh, one of the ways in which I'm a first is that uh, uh, I was elected during the second wave of the pandemic, and it has. I, we are now in the fourth wave of the pandemic. I'm in Ontario, where we had very, very severe uh, restrictions, particularly in Toronto, uh, and I just simply wasn't able to get out in the community other than virtually. And so this, Steve, has been really my first opportunity since becoming leader to actually connect with the people that I'm asking to trust me uh, with their vote. And so that is something I have to earn, and that's really important. Uh, the other thing is, and, you know, I try to, I mean, first, there's no hiding it, but also it's important to acknowledge it. Uh, you know, we, we just entered this election uh, not where we needed to be. Uh, we entered this election not as unified as we should have been, uh, and that has had consequences as well. Uh, there, I, I want to, if I'm traveling uh, to, to support our candidates, I want to make sure that it's helping them and not harming them and that I'm not trailing uh, our controversies uh, with me into ridings that we could potentially win. So those are some of the considerations in terms of uh, when I travel and, and how much I travel. And the carbon footprints, and I mean that. Hmm. Do, you, do you worry about leaving yourself open to the criticism that here's a National Party leader campaigning basically only in one riding? I know not exclusively, but basically. How can she get away with that? Well, you know, this is one of the things that, beyond the fact that we're having this election in the first place, which is very disappointing, one of the other things that has uh, has really disappointed me in terms of the the approach and the questions that I get asked about uh, about how we're doing things is that we seem to be, uh, not yet, but uh, at least on the cusp of emerging from this pandemic without having taken many of the lessons that we should have. Uh, I had thought that we would have much more, uh, much more exposure in this election to to modern campaigning techniques, things that weren't as heavy on a carbon footprint, things that created more authentic connections. But instead, what we see from all of the other parties is our leaders getting on their jumbo jets and then landing somewhere 
and usually staying at the airport or taking a big bus uh, to one location, making an announcement in front of their supporters, and then getting on the plane and doing it all over again. Uh, I don't know if just doing that actually creates a, a, a deeper connection with people. Um, we want to bring some new techniques, some new ways of, of connecting with people. And as I said, in my case, uh, I was elected at a time where, uh, again, no one has been a leader under the kind of circumstances that I have, and so I have to do things differently. And if we want small parties to get people elected, then we have to give them the opportunity to do things differently. Okay. Uh, for 90% for of this interview, we've talked policy and we've talked some, you know, where the Greens are ideologically on the spectrum and so on. And, uh, and now we get to the messy business here, the brass knuckles politics, which I've saved for okay. the end. And, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend for a second Great. that you, <laughs> I'm not going to pretend for, for a second that you're going to love this question. But, okay. Um, okay, there was an attempted coup within your party against your leadership, which is a pretty rough thing to do to a leader in the middle of an election campaign. And it was all brought on because of what has turned out to be a pretty significant disagreement within the Green Party on the issue of all things the Middle East, over which Canada has... <laughs> You know, precious little influence, frankly, uh, related to other countries. Can you explain to us how, and I guess I should set this up by saying you're Jewish, which a lot of people will not know, how is it that the Green Party gets derailed, not over disagreements about climate change or taxation or basic income, but for goodness sakes, Middle East policy? Well, first, I don't think uh, that it should matter at all that I'm Jewish, uh, because my what should matter more is that I am a former diplomat, that I worked as an advisor in the office of the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, and that I worked as a director for a uh, leading global NGO focused on uh, the prevention of of of, uh, of of death, you know, the pr protection of civilians in cases of deadly conflict. Uh, those are the things that guide my my um, my statements, that guide my approach uh, to international affairs. And so, whether it was the uh, the um, the flare up in May in the Israel Palestine uh, situation, uh, or any other global situation of conflict, uh, my approach is going to be the same. It's going to be an approach that focuses on preventing death of civilians uh, and de-escalation, which is what you need to prevent death of civilians. It's going to be focused on respect for the rule of law and international law. So um, I feel, as I always did, uh, very comfortable with uh, what I said and what my approach was, and I would have said it in any other situation, and I have said it in other uh, situations of conflict. Okay, let's do one more clip from last night's leaders' debate for setting up the last question here. Sheldon, if you would, from last night. Being who I am and in this position has been incredibly hard. Uh, being here tonight was not an obvious thing. I've had to crawl over a lot of broken glass to get here. I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to be the first of my kind. And because I am the first of my kind, I know that I won't be the last. I'm sure that resonated with a lot of people who feel that... Uh you know, they've got all kinds of ceilings that they've got to crack through in order to participate more fully in this society. What did you mean, though, when you said, I'm the first of my kind? I'm the first, um, I'm the first woman of, well, I'm the first woman of color. I'm the first black person. I'm the first Jewish woman uh, to be in this role. That's a lot of firsts. And I always say that, you know, I may have said that to you, Steve, before, that uh, I shouldn't represent so many firsts in, in politics after all this time. I think I'm only the fifth woman uh, to be uh, to be the le elected the leader of a major national party, a party with seats in parliament. Only the fifth in the history of our confederation. Uh, we still have parties like the Liberal Party who have never had a woman or a person of color lead them at all. And so uh, I, I do again want to say in this position that it is incredibly difficult. It has been an eye-opener, Steve, how incredibly difficult it is, how many barriers are thrown up uh, against you. Um, it is definitely not at all obvious that I would have arrived here. I, uh, it has taken a small village of people to give me the strength to go on much of the time. And I thought that I was savvy. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that I knew what I was getting into. So uh, I made it this far. And the fact that I have done that means that it can't be undone. And my hope is that it will be easier for the next person and that there will be more and more and more diversity on the leader stage going forward.
Well, as I say to all the leaders who will come in here for an interview, we thank you for your time. We wish you well on the campaign trail and stay safe out there. Thanks to Annamy Paul, the leader of the Greens. Thank you so much for having me as always. The terror attacks of September 11, 2001 rocked the world in many ways. But for Muslim people in the United States and everywhere, really, the ripple effects were many and substantial. Filmmaker Dia Khan explores that in her new Peabody Award-winning documentary, Muslim in America, Legacy of Fear. It has its North American broadcast premiere tomorrow on TVO, and we're pleased that it brings Dia Khan back to our airwaves tonight from Washington, D.C. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. What a it, pleasure. It's very nice to have you back on the show and for to meet you. Um, you know, terrific documentary. Before we start our conversation, I just wanted to show a short clip for the audience. Uh, Sheldon, could you please roll? These are people only believe in jihad. They don't want our system. They don't want our system. These are people that are here, by the way. People here. They want to change your religion. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Not going to happen. It's going to get worse and worse. You're going to have more World Trade Centers. It's going to get worse and worse, folks. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Um, you know, that was a clip from your documentary, and I didn't realize that that took place in 2015 before Trump was actually elected uh, as president. What was, the kind, what was the effect of that kind of rhetoric from President Trump? I think what that rhetoric did was normalize uh, discrimination against Muslims. I think it normalized the, the fears that people have. And some of the fears are, are, are legitimate in the sense that if the only uh, sort of story that Americans know, some Americans know about Muslims, is you know terrorist attacks by, by groups like ISIS, then I can understand that fear. But what he did is he instrumentalized that fear and, and pushed it uh, and manipulated it for the sake of his own votes, basically. So I think what he did is that he brought out into the public space um, the normalization of dehumanizing Muslims and othering Muslims and, and making it acceptable for people to treat Muslims as if they are an invading force, as if they are a, an enemy within. There is no Muslim race. There is a culture. What can, you, what can explain this intolerance towards Muslims? Well, I think, you know, ever since 9-11, I think before 9-11, there was very little, I think Muslims didn't particularly exist in the, in the psyche of, of Americans. Uh, so I think that really brought the word Muslim and Islam to the forefront. And I think, unfortunately, uh, what has happened is because of the, the focus on Muslims and the focus on terrorism sort of going hand in hand, and that being the only thing that people get to hear about Muslims, I think has, um, has, made, has made it possible for politicians like Trump and also various hate groups to utilize that for their own uh, gain. And I think... Um, I think, you know, Muslims have been dehumanized to such an extent where it's okay for a president to say something like that and for his audience to, to be jubilant and, and be really excited about him saying that we're not going to allow any more Muslims into this country. He made that okay. If he said that about any other group, it would not be acceptable. But somehow Muslims have been degraded and their humanity has been put so low uh, that that it's that's that passes as okay now. Um, are the experiences of Muslims <laughs> in other Western nations similar, or is this a specific American experience? I think uh, it's very similar uh, across Western countries. I think what Trump did and was sort of at the forefront of doing is he being in, in such a high position, being in the highest position in the country, articulating those views. You've had anti-Muslim and, and sort of far-right populist politicians all across Europe utilizing people's fears of Muslims for the gain of their, their, their own voting blocks, basically. But to have somebody in this high of position to articulate it and to, to weaponize it, as I say, to this extent, uh, is unique to the US. But he's still playing on a feeling and a tendency that exists everywhere. I mean, just look at the French 
uh, uh, politicians. And even right now, you know, if you look at what's happening in Afghanistan, the reluctance of a lot of countries, including the EU, you know, relating, uh, uh, releasing a statement, we will protect Europe against a flood of Afghans. What are Afghans? We don't want any more of these Muslims in our country. You know, nobody wants any more Muslims in their countries, really. So this is something that we can't just sign off as something that belongs to Trump. This is a, a tendency that is there across too many countries now. Every country has their own mini Trump now uh, that plays the same game. It's interesting you say that because for politicians to say things and not to have uh, pushback from the public is telling. You mentioned uh, yeah. the rhetoric being weaponized. And in the past, you've said that politics have real life implications what did you mean by that? Well, you know, when 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 Trump speaks like that, and 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 the equivalent Trumps across Europe speak like that, that translates into real life, into the streets of whatever country that they're speaking in, to impacting the lives of Muslims. Hate crimes against Muslims have gone up in pretty much in every country, and especially in the U.S. Since his election campaign, it shot up into it, it shot up, and it was part of the reason I wanted to make the film because that story wasn't really being told. Whenever people who claim to be Muslim are the perpetrators of violence, the way that story is told in our public space is very, very different than when Muslims become the victim. Of, of, of violence. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that hate crimes against Muslims have, have uh, gone up significantly uh, and nobody really reported on it, nobody really spoke about it. You know, what does it mean? You know, I, I kept thinking, what would it feel like to be a young child, to be an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, sitting at home watching your president saying, essentially, that people like you are not welcome in this country? How does that make somebody feel? How does that, where does that put you in the context of your own country and how much you actually belong or are accepted or respected or included in that society. It says a lot. So it does a lot to people emotionally, but also, as I say, violence against Muslims, physical attacks against Muslims also went up with very little attention, with very little coverage. And uh, in the documentary, you speak to um, a couple of Muslims who have experienced violence, uh, who have been, who are, who are the survivors of that uh, rhetoric. Um, I wanted to show a clip from the documentary. Sheldon, if you could please roll. What's really curious about it still, what's really interesting about it is that I've served not only as a Peace Corps volunteer, but I also served as a military interpreter with the Marines for three years. On the front lines against Islamic terrorism, the individuals that helped and harbored Al-Qaeda who attacked the United States, a country that I love very much. And what's interesting is I never thought that I'd deal with a sense of unwantedness after coming home from Afghanistan. Mm. It feels like you're not seen. It feels like you're never going to be good enough. Um, that was Baktash, who you featured in the documentary. He also said something that has just really stuck with me. He said that uh, the only home that he's ever known is his parents. And when you consider that he served, uh, he was in the Marines. Um, when we talk about patriots, some of the militia, uh, the people in the militias consider this, some, themselves to be patriots. I think anyone would consider Baktash to be a patriot, yet he faces this kind of uh, otherness. Um, what is his story? I, I actually have goosebumps, and I mean, I've, I've, I edited the film, I've, 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 I shot it, but he always, he, 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 the way he speaks and what he says always really, really touches me because his feelings and what he is going through and his experiences will never factor in on any kind of statistics or any kind of hate crime uh, uh, figures or anything like that. He was a he. He came to the to America when he was a child, fleeing uh, Afghanistan. And, and was so grateful to, to come to America. His family was so grateful to come to America. And every single thing that he could throughout his, his childhood and his, his teen years was to try desperately to fit in, to try desperately to be accepted and to be acknowledged as one of the group, one as, as an American. And he always felt rejected. He never felt like he was good enough. And I think, I mean, this is my interpretation, but I feel the part of the reason he joined the military uh, and, and went with America, actually back to Afghanistan, helping America, 
uh, I think part of that must have also been his gesture of wanting to do the ultimate, wanting to sacrifice the ultimate uh, and give his ultimate commitment to America. And even after he does that, that's sort of the heartbreak of his story is even after he does that, it's still not good enough. He's still not, he's still one of those people that are the enemy, the people that can never be trusted, the people that are not like us, the people that we should be afraid of and suspicious of, and people who we don't really truly actually want here. So, so what that must have done to him uh, is, is heartbreaking. Uh, and this, and this feeling that he carries with him resonates with so many of us. I mean, I come from a Muslim family as well. I've had, you know, when I was growing up, I, I, I felt the same. Um, and and, and, and it's, it, it breaks you in a way that is very difficult to sort of put back together again. Um, and I, 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 like, for example, even now, people think that this is just very extreme cases or, or, or that this sort of anti-Muslim sentiment isn't that prevalent. Even today, if I was to tweet something or go on social media and say something positive about Muslims or say that Muslims are victimized in this, that or other way, I will be inundated with anti-Muslim tweets well, why don't you talk about your jihadis? You people do this, you people cut your women, you people, I mean, it's just endless. So, so we're not allowed to be human. Muslims are not allowed to be human. Muslims are not allowed to hurt. Muslims are not allowed to be traumatized. Muslims are not allowed to have their own story that is complicated, that is full of their humanity. They're only allowed to be terrorists or the victims of their own communities in some way as women and and you know that's a that's an exhausting it's an exhausting story and an, and an exhausting context to have to constantly carry with you and um so so Bakhtash's story i think is the story actually of a lot of young muslims who feel dislocated and disconnected from their own country they want to be a part of their land they want to be a part of their country but their country doesn't want them in the same way and doesn't embrace them in the same way. And I think, too, there's a, a bit of a, a dismissal that can happen when you don't see the obvious wounds, like on the body, yes. um, that it's kind of like you're being a snowflake, you need to be tougher, yep. toughen up. Um, but in the documentary, you speak to Muslims who have been uh, injured, their lives were almost ended because of this hatred. and. I don't know if it says something about me that I was surprised um, that uh, a couple of them actually forgave their attackers. Um, what did you make of their ability to forgive these heinous acts? I thought it was extraordinary. You know, one of the stories is, is, is of this man who was shot 10 days, shot in the face 10 days after 9-11. By, by a white supremacist who was seeking revenge on Muslims and was, was looking for uh, Arabs, is what he was saying. And this, this, this you know, race, Buyan, he survived the attack. And, and after sort of putting his life back together, he dedicated his life because Mark Strom and his attacker was, was arrested and then uh, subsequently put on death row because he'd killed two other people in this kill, shooting spree. And race Buyan, this Muslim immigrant from Bangladesh, spent years of his life trying to get this man uh, off of death row and, and forgave him. And, and uh, similarly, another young woman, Asma Jama, who, who forgave her attacker as well. Uh, I think the, reason, the, the fact that you're surprised by it as well, I think is really telling because again, this comes back to the stories that we tell about each other. If we don't if, if we don't know Muslims, if we don't, if we don't know Muslims to just be human beings, to be amazing, to be creative, to be have the capacity to forgive uh, and have mercy and to have compassion, and also do horrible, horrible things. If 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 Muslims are not allowed to have the range of uh, emotions and behaviors of what it means to be a human being, then we're sort of flattening and dehumanizing them. And I think. The fact that we we have a hard time wrapping our head, head around Muslims having the capacity to forgive and to engage in this sort of way says something about how little we know about uh, 
the Muslim experience and, and, and the way so many people express their faith. Mm -hmm. So Actually, we are allowing terrorists and, and extremists on the Muslim side to define mm -hmm. what it means to be a Muslim. We're I, all doing that. I think for me, uh, what was surprising, I kept thinking that the people who committed these acts, um, the way that you said, you know, how you describe it, it's a flattened image, that if the roles were reversed, I wonder if they, if that humanity could have been shown to, uh, if they would be able to show that humanity to that individual. Uh, Ray's, for example, mentions that he can still feel the pellets um, yeah. in his face. And yeah. uh, to be able to forgive someone and to advocate for them is just extraordinary. extraordinary. Yeah. It's so touching. Yeah. It's so touching. And it's, you know, uh, uh, if, and this is, again, one of the reasons why it was so important to try and tell these stories and to try and make this film, because these stories are not in our public space. And also, anytime violence happens, if when the perpetrator is Muslim, the kind of coverage and attention that that attack gets, it's wall-to-wall -wall coverage in every Western country. But when an attack against race Guyan happens because he's a Muslim, we don't see the same level of coverage. And I found so many stories that, and that I wasn't even able to include in this film. And I remember thinking at the time, this is incredible. Why have I never heard of this? You know. And then I look through the, the press coverage that it's gotten and it's minuscule in comparison. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Why is it when a Muslim is a victim, it doesn't get the same coverage as if when a Muslim is the actual perpetrator? What does that, just that in itself says something, is the life and humanity uh, of, of a Muslim less valued and less important to us than the lives and, and, and violence committed against white people? Um, you, know? you, you also featured uh, the family of a man sentenced to 30 years in prison um, for a plot to bomb an apartment building where many Muslims lived. Um, and these were Somali, largely Somali uh, refugees. What did his family tell you um, that led Patrick Stein down the path that he took? Uh, it was a, it was an extraordinarily wonderful family, absolutely broken by by what has happened to them and the fact that they've now lost their son to to this very long prison sentence. Uh, what they told me is the is the changes that they noticed in him and the process of radicalization that he went through, and the fact that the part of his radicalization was Trump's rhetoric. I thought was really important. And, and again, something that's not examined enough what this type of political rhetoric does to people. So he had gone from uh, sort of starting on the same baseline fear that, that a lot of people have of, of Muslims and not knowing very much about them to then starting to hear his president legitimizing his fears and not only legitimizing those fears, but giving a solution, that the solution is these people should not be here. So let's stop any more of them from coming in and let's figure out the ones that are here. So, so sort of positioning Muslims as, uh, uh, as an enemy within that need to be dealt with. And then on top of that, then he started uh, uh, delving farther and farther into far right media uh, and basically immersed himself or became trapped in this echo chamber where everything that he would hear about Muslims would just be the same loop and same loop. And, and also the sort of volume of it becoming more and more intensified, the dehumanizations of Muslim, the dehumanization of Muslims getting more and more dialed up where he got to the point where he realized or felt that actually violence against them is perfectly acceptable. And he used words uh, and you hear it a little bit in the film, and, and there's there's more in some of the transcripts, talking about Muslims as cockroaches, mm. talking about them as a vermin, and talking about himself as an exterminator, that he was going to clean this up. Where, when have we heard that type of language before? Anytime there is genocide, anytime there is, there is extreme violence against people, you hear people dehumanized down to cockroaches and insects that need to be exterminated, need to be, that there's an infestation of them in our country and we need to handle it. And this is very, very dangerous. And the, the I wouldn't say that Trump was the only radicalizing factor in his, in his sort of Path of becoming as extreme as he did, but he was a significant part of his radicalization. That is something worthy of note. And that is not just something worthy of note from America, but that's also worthy of note of all of our other mini Trumps that we have now across everywhere. And, and you know this in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well as anybody, what this type of radicalization makes people capable of.
we're seeing attacks against Muslims. We saw it in, we've seen it in Canada, we've seen it in Norway, Breivik, you know, killed, took the lives of 70 plus young white kids because he was, uh, he feels that their parents and people like them are inviting in Muslims and we don't want Muslims here. What happened in New Zealand? And these attacks are going to continue, I'm afraid to say. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, it's for watching it. You spoke to um, some militia members who are uh, targeting the Muslim community, and one of them said that everybody wants to belong, nobody wants to be an outcast, which struck me as interesting because, uh, you know, for race um, and even Bakhtash, they also wanted to belong. And I think that's something that uh, these groups are using to say that they're looking for belonging, yet the people they're targeting are also looking for belonging. Yes. I mean, you know, the, this is what really strikes me as incredibly important. I've done films about jihadis. I've done films about white supremacists. I've done film, you know, about, you know, uh, abortion terrorists. Um, one of the uniting factors, one of the most basic human needs that we all have is the need to want to belong. And it's such a profound need that we all have to be seen, to be heard, to be valued, to be understood, and to be a part of a greater whole. And, and just like you're saying, Bakhtash has that need, these, these militia guys, even the jihad, all, me, all of us, we have this. Where our politics is failing us is our politics is a politics of fear rather than a politics of solidarity. We need our politicians to be able to articulate that these are the same needs that we all have. We have all the same challenges and the solutions also have to be solutions that include all of us rather than taking these needs and driving wedges of division even deeper, separating us even more from each other. It's, so, it's that group's fault that you're not doing well. It's that group's fault that, you're, that, that inequality is rising. And that's obviously not the case. So, so, so I, I do put a lot of the responsibility on our politics and our politicians and how they are not stepping into creating a, a, a politics that includes everybody, but also our media quite honestly. Uh, uh, and it's part of the reason I actually started making films was to try and tell stories that, that can help us understand each other better. You know, whenever I filmed even with the militia guys, I was, I'm very, very uh, clear about the fact that even though they might believe things that I don't believe, even though the, their positions and even their actions are very, very problematic and also violent and, and dangerous, I refuse to dehumanize them. Even if they dehumanize people, I will not do it to them because we have to break that cycle. And I still wanted to make sure that their side of the story was told with the same tenderness and the same respect uh, and the same humanity. So I can also not flatten, just as much as I'm sitting here saying, you can't flatten Muslims' humanity, you also can't do that to these people as easy as it is and as satisfying as it probably would feel, you can't do it. You know, we have to stop breaking the silence of us and them and the divisions and the hatreds and the fears. The only way to bridge it is we have to talk to each other. We have to understand each other and we have to try and build bridges of understanding between people. And with some, some, some are too far gone, we can't do that. But with very many, it is doable, but we have to invest the effort and I wish our politicians would but they're not so then it's down to us to to, to communities to Baghdad to me mm -hmm. to some of these militia you know to, for all of us to go we're gonna have to figure this out because we have to find a way to live together Dia, this is a terrific documentary. Congratulations on the Peabody. Um, we're looking forward to watching Muslim in America, Legacy of Fear. It's going to be premiering this Saturday, September 11th at 9 p.m. Dia, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. While some Ontario police departments have reported an increase in hate crimes over the course of the last year, some are reporting a decrease. The disparity raises not only questions about reporting, but calls for a consistent definition of what constitutes a hate crime. Joining us now for more on that from the provincial capital, Ashley Aquosa, TVO.org's diversity and inclusion reporter. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Jan. How are you? Not too bad. So let's get into this. You've been doing some investigation. Uh, how exactly do police determine what is a hate crime? Uh, so police services or police departments have different definitions of what a hate crime is. So I'll use Hamilton, for example. 
they actually differentiate between a hate-motivated crime and a hate-motivated incident. A hate-motivated crime is like a criminal offense. An example could include assault, uh, damage to property, or uttering threats. And um, for it to kind of meet that standard of a hate-motivated crime, there has to be evidence to prove that the offense was motivated solely or in part because of a bias or prejudice based on a victim's race, um, national or ethnic origin, sexual orientation, physical disability, or so to speak. Um, while for a hate-motivated incident, um, you know, these are incidents that where it cannot be proven to have been motivated solely or in part because of a person's bias or prejudice towards the victim, but it includes some kind of racial um, overtone. So different police services have different ways of categorizing this and then responding to these incidents. And experts are saying that this affects data collection and trust in community members because they're not sure how a police department is going to respond when they report something to them. Okay, let's talk uh, data. You did some calling to some police services. Let's have a look at some of the numbers. Here we see in Halton, hate crimes have increased by 160% over 2019. In Ottawa, 56.9%. And then moving on to Toronto, there's been a 51% increase. And in London, hate crimes have risen by 46%. Some viewers there will remember uh, the tragic attack in last June where a Muslim family was going out for a walk and run down, police say, in that attack, it was motivated by hate. And then lastly, in Hamilton, surprise there a little bit, slight decrease. So I want to get uh, the story behind these numbers. We'll start with Halton. Fairly high yeah. increase, 160%. What's going on there? Um, so a lot of police departments actually put out these, you know, hate crime reports or in their more general reports kind of indicate what's going on in relation to hate crime. Not a lot of police departments do this, but um, a good number do. And in Halton, um, in their report, they actually noted that they had about 66 um, reported incidents over the last year, which is a rise from 25 from the previous year. Mm. So that's kind of where you get that, you know, percentage. And in a local paper, the police chief actually pointed to a rise in anti-Asian racism, which has been inflamed because of COVID-19. And um, they also pointed to a pushback against the Black Lives Matter movement, which really skyrocketed last summer. But what was really interesting is that they said, even with the significant um, increase, they do believe that there's still some underreporting happening. And some of this reporting might not include some of like the less overt um, hate or bias motivated incidents. Very interesting. I'm curious about the city of London. Um, do you think that spike has anything to do with the attack last June? I mean, it, it, you know, it's possible. Experts didn't really point to that. I think a lot of the experts that I spoke to who have been looking at this issue for a while say that hate crimes have been consistently on the rise for, for a very long time. What they will say, um, you know, kind of came out of the unfortunate attack in London was just a, a louder call for reform. You know, um, you know, the National Council of Canadian Muslims actually released a really lengthy um, recommendation list for the federal government, the provincial and municipal governments, and a lot of other groups have followed suit. Is there any information on the specific targets of these crimes? Do police release that data as well? Uh, yeah, you know, so I think um, in... I I think in Ottawa, you know, for example, I think they pointed to race and ethnicity, mm -hmm. you know, being like 90% of the motivation for, you know, some of the hate crimes. And in Toronto, where you mentioned um, hate crimes had risen by like 51%, they had identified Jewish, Black, the LGBTQ2S and Asian communities as the most victimized groups. Okay, so uh, looking back at that, uh, at that board with the stats, Hamilton, I got to say, very surprised by that, only because only a few years ago, this was one of the highest in the country when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, hate crimes. W what's going on there? So advocates are actually saying that there hasn't been a decrease. They're just more worried about underreporting. So, for example, I think last March it was the Hamilton Police Service launched this online reporting tool that would encourage citizens to report hate crimes online. So between March and December, they had about 108 um, you know, reports that were submitted, but they had only categorized 22 as meeting the requirement or the criteria for hate or bias reporting. So I think that's what advocates are really afraid about, that, you know, people are reporting these, um, you know, these crimes or these incidents, but they aren't being categorized as hate crimes. And that in turn is then discouraging people from reporting. Um, you had mentioned talking to advocates, uh, solutions. Uh, I know this is quite a big, quite a big problem, not something that's going to be yeah. fixed overnight, but what have you been hearing? 
So a lot of um, for the proposed solutions, there is the Bill C-36, which will clarify like the definition of online hate, hate speech as a form of discrimination. A lot of advocates are calling for that because, you know, people say that a lot of this, um, you know, like misinformation or disinformation that propels hate crimes originates online. So they were calling for that. A lot of people were also calling for a standalone definition of hate crimes in the criminal code. So currently the criminal code recognizes public incitements of hatred against an identifiable group or willful um, incitements of hatred. So willful is that, that kind of makes it a little bit more of a higher burden to prove. So what people are calling for is really just a standalone section of the criminal code that will define, you know, what a hate crime is, which will then in turn help people collecting data about hate crime and then which will hopefully inform how um, police departments respond to hate crimes. I have a couple seconds left. Of course, we're in, a pan in an election right now. Um, are we hearing anything on the election campaign? Uh, so, uh, you know, TVO.org, we actually reached out to um, a number of the parties just looking for comment and to clarify whether they had taken into consideration this idea of creating a standalone hate crime definition in the criminal code. Um, a representative for NDP actually responded and said that the party commits to establishing a national standard for identifying and recording all hate incidents. And the hope is that this would create a more thorough and standardized definition of what constitutes a hate crime. You know, some other parties haven't responded, but going through their plans, there are all mentions of hate crimes. Like the Conservative Party, for example, says that it aims to double funding for a program called the Security Infrastructure Program and simplify the application so groups will be able to apply for funding to protect, you know, protect themselves. The Green Party says that it will provide um, funding for data collection and, to and it will support research and advocacy organizations looking to address online hate and offline hate. And the Liberal Party mentioned that it will um, present a national action plan on combating hate. It will introduce legislation within its first 100 days and also create um, a support fund for survivors of hate crimes. Something we will keep an eye out for. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you so much, Shane. And that's it for this Friday, September 10, 2021. Our federal election coverage continues Monday with a look at the anger and vitriol that politicians are facing on the campaign trail. I am Jane Jaganathan. Thank you for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve, we'll see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.